Yeah, g'day heathers and gentlemen. Welcome back to my channel where I like playing around with these old CNC machines. My current project is modernizing this lovely old Shelblin lathe. So in this episode it's time we talk about the Axis drive motors and how to size them. Spoiler alert, I already bought the replacements. This lathe was conceived in the 1970s, so its control predates DOS. Oh, that smells better. And Shelblin obviously chose an American motion control vendor because the computer is from Data General. These drive motors have 5 8 inch shafts and they're made in Mexico. They decided to do the feedback with synchros, which is supposedly very nice and very accurate, but I could only find one drive in Europe from Granite Drives that could interpret those, and they were also pretty expensive. Being a DC system, it needed an enormous transformer. The thing weighs a ton. Also, these drive electronics are enormous. Not sure if the drivers were made by Dexin or they just used some Dexin aluminium to make the front plate. By the way, these enormous drivers, and there are of course two of them, they needed to go. Then to protect the motor, its synchro and its wiring, Shoblin put these enormous castings over the top. Man, these are huge. Man, there's got to be another solution. But before diving deeper into the sizing of the Axi motors, remember I complained about 30 days without rain here? Well, man, I didn't ask for snow. Anyway, before returning to today's program, I need to thank all of you who gave me feedback on the spindle control last week, and it was a lot of you. This has been really helpful, both in bringing up aspects of the control which I hadn't considered, and helping me to collect my thoughts. Here's a summary of some of the pros and cons of using a variator versus the VFD as the primary speed control. To truly optimize the variator's strengths while eliminating the disadvantages would require either switching the existing three-phase variator control motor to a servo or at least controlling it with an additional VFD. But given the wide overlap in the control authority of these two, I'm not convinced that this is actually needed. So I think my first attempt will be to control the VFD to four or five roughly fixed gear ratio, adding some randomization to the timing of that dead reckoning in order to prevent them from wearing grooves into the same spots in the sheaths each time. As these ideas will need to be implemented in a Linux CNC control component, in C, the next step will be to map out the control logic. I did this with my Maho CNC's Mills gearbox as well, so a friend knew what he was programming. Man, I can't program much beyond. Hello world! Once again, thanks for your help. Let's get back to the Axis motors. Now I could have gone for steppers, but I don't like the noise they make, and they'd need the DC power supply. I could have modified the existing servos over for encoders, but then I'd still need the huge power supply. Modern AC servos have come down enough in price these days that it just seemed like the best way to go. The encoder's already nicely integrated, and it should run smoothly and quietly. The drivers will happily eat single-phase power straight from the wall, no transformer required, and they'll even pass through the encoder signal, so I can plug that into Linux CNC, and it can close the position loop. Having decided to change the motors, how do you choose new ones? What method of calculating ensures that the replacements will perform well? Luckily, the Technical University here in Vienna offers a course in machine tool design taught by Professor Bleicher, so I took it. It was a really good course, and it covered all aspects of design, from stiffness and deflection calculations of foundations, machine bases, and motion hardware, through to machine dynamics, damping, and performance. Last week, I did a Patreon live stream on sizing drives, and the guys pointed out a couple of mistakes that I'd made. I figured I'd address them to solidify my learning, and also make a video to serve the wider audience. The taught method of sizing motors requires calculating the moment of inertia of the driven system and the torque required to move it, and then catalogue diving for motors with matching characteristics. So it's pretty simple. Let's also look at some of the limitations of this for us home shot retrofit guys. First up, you need to know the moment of inertia of the rotated spindle components. The maths is just simple algebra. I'm using the Schaublin 125 CNC's cross slide as a worked example to see if the motor and driver I bought before doing the course was a good choice or a waste of money. Hey, I got a question. Stop the video and drop an answer in the comments section. Do you think I got lucky on these motors? Or do you think I wasted my money? So you can model a lead screw basically as three parts. There's the screw. 
here I'm simplifying a 16 by 4 ball screw into a 15 millimeter steel rod plus a shorter diameter bar adding up the bearing and erasers and then a thicker bar for the pulley. Tuzan called me out for cheating here with the use of a calculation for steel instead of bronze. For full accuracy I'd need to model that pulley but we'll stick to the simplification for now. Although once you plug in the numbers, you see that the pulley has by far the greatest moment of inertia. So I guess Duzan's right, and I really should be more accurate here. Once you have the moment of inertia of the rotating components, you need to calculate the effective moment of inertia due to the translation of masses. The formula assumes a mill with a moving table and a workpiece fixtured onto it. Here I weighed the cross slide and estimated the nut mass, also weighed the tool changer and the back side tool post. Plugging them in, you see that on a light axis like this, this has much less influence on the total inertia than the rotating parts. It's here that I made another error when I first calculated this, as Paul pointed out that I failed to compensate for the belt reduction. Thanks Paul. As the reduction goes into the calculation, as the reciprocal of the ratio squared, small variations in reduction ratio can have a significant effect on the reflected inertia which the motor experiences. In this case, the motor driven pulley is acting as the coupling. And the ones I'm recycling from the Schaublin have a rather massive clamping collar, which shows up here as a significant moment of inertia, greater than the reflected inertia of the whole drive system. This is where science beats guessing. It's unlikely that someone starting a conversion and guessing which motor to choose would identify that the recycled pulley is a significant component driving the motor choice. Now that we know the moment of inertia that the motor is coupled to, we need to also consider the torque required. This is probably a more intuitive part to most. The moments come from three aspects of the driven load. In this slide, we're looking at the moment derived from the cutting force. I just assumed a 3mm depth of cut with a 0.1mm feed facing in steel. Here, I input the cutting parameters into an online cutting force calculator, which returned the cutting forces. I know the graphic shows turning. The force components we're interested in here are the tangential force pushing down into the cross slide and the feed force on the ball screw. Then we need to look at the moment derived from the moving masses. 0.1 seems to be a typical friction coefficient for a lubricated plane sliding way. You can see that the resulting moment's pretty low for such a small low mass axis. Next we have to consider the frictional losses in the lead screw bearings. But with these small bearings, it doesn't amount to much. As the power is transmitted through a ball nut and also through a reduction belt, their losses need to be considered. And with that, we now know the minimum torque our motor is going to need to supply and the reflected moment of inertia. So we can now dive into a catalog to select a motor based on its moment of inertia and on rated torque. Or in my case, since I already bought the motors, let's see if they were a good choice. The rule of thumb we were taught was that a motor inertia, double the reflected moment of inertia of the load, will result in a highly dynamic machine. A more typical machine should still have a motor inertia of between half of or equal to the reflected load. The motor I have for the x-axis falls in that range. The motor also needs to produce adequate torque for the axis, and this motor easily exceeds that at rated power. In fact, it's a significant overkill in that sense, and a more compact, cheaper motor could probably have been chosen. You also need to check if the selected motor can drive your axis at the target rapid rate. Again, here I'm well into overkill, far less than a modern production CNC machine, but you know, I don't want to go crazy here. There are plenty of other aspects of design not covered here, such as stiffness, resonant frequencies, damping, etc. But this gives us a bit of a taste of how industry approaches the engineering of CNC machines. With these motors, I'm not sure if the Schaublin will have the dynamic performance to do some of the funky lathe stuff like polygon turning or cam turning. But that's probably best left to rolling element linear guide machines, as it's more likely to gall a plain slideway. So there we have it. The motor I chose turned out to be a surprisingly good choice for this x-axis. I still need to make up an adapter plate to replace this one. And I also need to address the different diameters of the shaft to get the pulley to fit. I haven't run the numbers for the z-axis yet, which has obviously got a much greater moving mass and a much more massive ball screw. But it also has a higher reduction ratio, nearly 3 to 1. That'll go into the calculations, reducing the moment of inertia to about a ninth. May still be a good match, need to run those numbers. I hope this video wasn't too boring, but I was generally enthusiastic about learning a new thing, so if you like what you saw, give it a thumbs up, maybe consider subscribing, and I'll see you again next week. Thanks for watching.